The purpose of this presentation is to review the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. The objectives of this presentation are to review how the virus that causes COVID-19 is spread and the measures that can be put in place to reduce the risk of spread. We will also review the variants of concern, or VOCs, and the implications for infection prevention and control in schools and childcare settings. Infections with respiratory viruses are primarily transmitted through three modes, droplet, contact, and airborne. These categories are not mutually exclusive as transmission occurs along a spectrum. Droplet transmission is when infection is spread through exposure to virus-containing droplets that are exhaled by an infectious person. Once exhaled, the concentration of droplets decreases by fallout from the air, with the largest droplets falling first and then smaller particles dilute in the growing volume of air. As a result, transmission is most likely to occur when someone is close to the infectious person, generally within about 2 meters or 6 feet. Contact transmission is when infection is spread by direct contact with an infectious person, for example, holding or shaking hands, or contact with a contaminated item or surface, which is also called fomite transmission. Airborne transmission is when infection is spread by exposure to the smaller virus-containing respiratory droplets, also called aerosols, that can remain suspended in the air over long distances and over long periods of time. SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory virus, so similarly, transmission occurs on a spectrum. It is primarily transmitted by close, unprotected contact with droplets which spread at close range. These droplets can vary in size from large droplets that fall to the ground around the infected person within seconds or minutes to smaller droplets, sometimes called aerosols. The role of both droplets and aerosols has been suggested to be most important for transmission in close range. Less commonly, smaller droplets or aerosols can spread over longer distances and may be suspended for longer periods of time. Lastly, COVID-19 can potentially spread indirectly through contact with surfaces that have been touched or sneezed on by someone who is ill with COVID-19. The virus could survive from hours up to seven days on some surfaces, such as metal and plastic, but it does not seem to spread easily this way. When a person has infection, whether or not transmission from that person occurs depends on multiple factors. Examples include vaccination, being fully vaccinated reduces infection risk, personal protective measures, for example, physical distancing, wearing a well-fitted mask, and being fully vaccinated reduce the risk. How forcefully aerosols and droplets are expelled, for example, singing or coughing are associated with higher risk. The amount of virus present, for example, more viruses present early in the infection. The duration of the exposure, for example, longer contact with an infectious person is higher risk and environmental conditions, for example, good ventilation and outdoors are associated with lower risk. Now that we know how the virus is spread, it can help us to better understand the measures that will reduce our risk of acquiring infection. As a starting point, the risk of transmission is higher indoors, particularly when physical distancing is not practiced and or when masking is not practiced consistently by all. This is why avoiding crowded places and limiting time in enclosed spaces are important measures at work and in the community. As mentioned, COVID-19 spreads primarily by respiratory droplets and aerosols, particularly when in close proximity to an infected person. This is why keeping a distance of six feet or more can help reduce the risk of transmission. Other practices that can reduce the risk of droplet and aerosol spread include practicing good respiratory etiquette, 
such as coughing into a sleeve, wearing a mask, and optimizing ventilation. For example, increasing outdoor air by keeping windows or doors open. Increasing outdoor air will dilute and replace any air contaminated with SARS-CoV-2 virus or other air pollutants. While much less common, transmission can also occur through contact with surfaces that have been touched or sneezed on by someone who is ill with COVID-19. This is why making sure you clean your hands frequently with soap and water or alcohol-based hand rub plays an important role in reducing the risk of infection. You can also reduce your risk by not touching your eyes, nose, and mouth, as this is how the virus can enter your system to cause infection. Finally, keeping surfaces clean can help reduce the risk and the focus should be on high touch surfaces like door handles. The hierarchy of hazard controls from the Center for Disease Control is an approach to containment of hazards in the workplace, describing the layered occupational health and safety approaches. This slide shows how this can be adapted to schools and childcare settings and highlights the need for a bundle of health and safety measures to reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission. At the top are the elimination and substitution strategies, which are most effective at preventing exposures and involves physically removing or replacing the hazard. In the context of COVID-19, this is where controlling community transmission will most effectively reduce the risk of cases being imported into schools and childcare settings. A robust screening process to identify symptomatic individuals, as well as case and contact management, are important strategies to reduce the risk of infectious individuals entering the school or childcare setting. Vaccination also plays a key role in preventing COVID-19 infection. Next on the hierarchy are the engineering controls, such as physical barriers, point-of-care alcohol-based hand rub, and heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, or HVAC systems, and the administrative controls, including policies and procedures, education, and training. Personal protective equipment is considered the last line of defense and should not be relied on as the primary preventative measure for COVID-19, although it still plays an important role. As previously mentioned, it is the bundle of health and safety measures rather than one specific measure that needs to be put into place to help reduce infection risk given the spectrum of transmission. Finally, I will end this presentation by discussing the variants of concern, or VOCs. First, it is important to note that variants are common with respiratory viruses, including coronaviruses. However, a variant becomes a variant of concern when its changes have a clinical or public health significance that affects one or more of its transmissibility or spread, its virulence or severity of disease, vaccine effectiveness, or diagnostic testing. VOCs have been identified globally and in Ontario. Currently, there are four variants of concern that are being closely monitored in Canada. These include the Alpha variant, or B117 variant, that was first identified in the United Kingdom, the Beta variant, or B1351 variant, that was first identified in South Africa, the Gamma variant, or P1 variant, that was first identified in Brazil, and the Delta variant, or B16172 variant, that was first identified in India. Other variants have emerged. Laboratory and surveillance data are being closely monitored to gather evidence on their impact and identify those that have clinical or public health significance. So do you need to do anything differently because of the current VOCs? At the present time, the answer is no. The VOCs to date seem to be more transmissible or more contagious, but show no evidence of being fundamentally different in their mode of transmission. What does this mean? It means that someone who is infected with a VOC is more likely to transmit the disease, but the recommended preventative measures remain the same. The evolution of the pandemic is being monitored closely and public health measures will be updated as needed. If you would like more information, please see the list of resources here. 
Public Health Ontario would appreciate your thoughts on these refresher presentations. Please visit PHO's School Resources webpage to access and complete a short survey. If you have any questions, please email communications at oahpp.ca. Thank you.